everyone. Welcome to this month's episode of the District Insider. I'm your host, Shannon Callahan from Freedom High School. We have many great videos from all around the district for you, but let's start things off from Mitchman Middle School with a one-on-one -on -one tour. Hi, I'm Pete Mays, the principal here at Nitchman Middle School. We'd like to welcome you to the new Nitchman Middle School. Today we're going to give you a little tour of the inside and talk about some of the big places now that the building is complete. Welcome to the new Nitchman Middle School Auditorium. The brand new auditorium here seats 776 people. We're excited to use it for a variety of activities, including musical concerts, um, plays, community activities, and assemblies for our school. Welcome to the home of the Nitra Middle School Band. It's one of the spaces we're most proud of in our new school. It allows us to seat our almost 200 student band and band front here for practice and instructional music lessons. It's one of the highlights of the Bethlehem Area School District that we still continue to put great energy and effort towards our performing arts so that middle school kids can learn to perform, sing, play instruments, and act in addition to their regular school work. Welcome to the first floor eighth grade hallway. We stopped here to show off a little bit of a special area called the collaboration area. We wanted to design a flexible space that can grow with time over the 21st century. Here in this area, you'll see tables for small groups of students working, whiteboards and smart TVs so that the kids can brainstorm collaboratively and work on their schoolwork and activities together. This was a really important space for our students. They were looking for an area to come together uh, when our teams are working on other, other activities. So this works out great for everybody. Welcome to the Nitchman Gymnasium, home of the Lions. The brand new gymnasium will seat nearly a thousand people and allows us to have not only physical education class, but also sporting events for our interscholastic teams and then every night for our community activities and community groups. It's a great space that really shows off what it makes, it pr makes us proud to be Lions. Welcome to one of our most favorite spaces in the entire school. This is the fab fabrication suite in our engineering lab. In this lab, we've taken wood shop and metal shop from our old design into a brand new lifespan. This allows us to teach kids about science, technology, and math in relation to constructing things like cars, boats, and catapults. We have the systems in our other classrooms to both use computer-aided design and engineering skills to fabricate them, either on 3D printers, laser engravers, or CNC routers, and then use some of the traditional machines from woodworking or metalworking from the past to create new objects like cars and boats, where we can test kids' experiences with engineering and give them an opportunity to explore a future career. When it's time for breakfast or lunch, it's time for the Lions to come down to the Nitchman cafeteria. Here on the ground floor, we have a great space that'll allow us to feed up to 300 students at a time. They can also eat inside or outside on our brand new patio, and there's lots of flexible seating for students to gather with their friends. Also here, there's a college-style cafeteria where kids can choose their menu items, and also the school store, the Lion's Den, where kids can pick up some swag or some memorabilia or even some school supplies to help them get through their day. Welcome to the Nitchman Library, the true heart of any, any middle school. Here, not only do we still have book circulation and a computer lab to go along with it, but it is already developing into a place where people gather. Classes gather during the school day for instruction. Students gather here before and after school to finish homework or get a start on their activities or use a computer if they don't have one at home. The library is, has always been a big part of Nitchman, but it is continuing that drive today. One of the questions that we often get is, what does a science lab or a classroom look like? And this is a great example here on the third floor of the science lab. Here in the lab, we have some flexible furniture, stools or seats for children, and a projection system and integrated computer system for our teachers to use. Not to mention, lots of big windows with lots of bright light to let light in during the day, and also a nice space for kids to work and collaborate in, which is one of the underlying ideas for the design of the whole building. From up here on top of the new niche of middle school, you'll see great vantage points of West Bethlehem and Martin Towers. Here is one of the best places to see the overall project and see the great things that this school has accomplished so far. 
Nestled here in West Bethlehem, you'll see that it matches the other buildings and has a great point to oversee areas where students come from all over West Bethlehem and Hanover Township to join us here at Nichman. We hope that you've enjoyed our tour of our new school and we look forward to seeing you soon. We hope you enjoyed your personalized tour with Mr. Mays. Now let's head over to Fountain Hill where we have amazing teachers and students. Take a look. I think at Fountain Hill we are like a family. Um, we are very good at building those relationships. I think teachers go out of their way to get to know their students. They get to know their families. Um, parents are welcome to come in and be a part of our school. Community members are able to come in, build those relationships up. Um, the education we deliver here is very rigorous and I think it can be challenging, but I think it's those strong bonds and supportive relationships that even the staff has with each other that helps us meet the needs of our students every single day. Did we get 10 cubes in all yet? Nope, so our game continues. Jackson, you may go. So here at Fountain Hill Elementary, there's a huge sense of school pride. You can see that among staff, among students. Um, almost every day after school, we have former students who maybe now are at Brockle or at Liberty. They come back to pick up a little brother or sister or sometimes just to visit and they want to see all of their teachers, they want to come in and talk to our principal and our secretaries, they want to see their old classroom. It's just a huge sense of family and community here at Fountain Hill. In the morning my son wakes up and he's excited to come to school, play with friends, learn, he loves math. I like the staff, I like the fact that everybody works together, my children have lots of friends, they've learn to make new friends, all, everything. Everything is good about Fountain Hill. Fountain Hill has been outstanding. I'm a New Yorker, and in New York City, we don't get the attention that the school gives us here at Fountain Hill. Um, I've been here nine years, and in the nine years, I found that Fountain Hill has given back so much more, not only to the community, but as well as to my kids, as well as myself. Um, and what I mean by that is, my son is 11 years old, and in New York City, I would have never known unless been done by the teachers and one thing that they did here is that they basically found out that my son is gifted. The fact that he's gifted that means you're paying attention to my child. You're literally paying attention and seeing what are his special skills that he has and are pushing and helping him to do that. I've never been in a school that has done that before and that, that being said I cannot say anything more about Colin Hill than the fact that the teachers are outstanding, the staff and then just the curriculum that they have going. Unbelievable. Fountain Hill Elementary School, a warm and welcoming place where students learn, lead, imagine, and become. Fountain Hill is one of our biggest schools, hosting more than 500 students. Now let's head out with some Freedom and Liberty students who are raising awareness mini fun style. Today we have our mini mini thon at Asa Packer Elementary. Um, we like to do these throughout outside of the high schools and the middle schools so that we can spread awareness so that by the time they reach high school we have the opportunity to include more members into our group. Eventually hopefully they move up and that they spread awareness throughout the community and everywhere as they go to college so that we know what we're doing for the cause. The kids are so excited. I love coming here. I did this last year. Um, just spreading awareness but they're also having fun with it so they know it's not all serious, that they're doing this for something good so they can see what other kids are missing out on so they know that they can donate, they can do something to make it change for everybody else. Um, it's an event we've been doing in partnership with the elementary schools for about three or four years now. We go to the elementary schools and we hold, just as it sounds, a mini mini-thon. And we do activities with them, we explain what our cause is, we tell them like the Four Diamonds story, we teach them the line dance, and it's just a way for us to show them like what our cause is and that you can have fun just as we do while supporting a good cause. It's widely known now what we are and when we come in kids know like that we're from Minithon. Even today we ask like does anyone know what Minithon does and all the kids rose their hands and they knew and that's impressive to me because I remember like my freshman year it wasn't like that so we've definitely reached out and it's made big progress in like spreading our awareness for pediatric cancer.
Freedom and Liberty students are busy getting ready for their main event coming up this spring. Now let's head down to the Science Department where students are helping to keep the Lehigh Valley beautiful. AP Environmental Science is a class that's supposed to introduce students to basically a first year course in college of environmental science. Currently we're studying populations, we're also going to be talking about succession, which is how ecosystems change over time. Um, so the students are doing some activities in class right now and then we're hoping to take some of those things out uh, on some field trips coming up. Typically what we do is um, for each unit or chapter, obviously there's certain vocabulary, certain big ideas that they have to know. So we go over those types of things. Um, then for activities, something usually hands on. Sometimes it's a lab, sometimes it's something on the computer, um, sometimes it's a simulation, just depends on the topic. Uh, for this particular one where we're gonna be talking about succession, um, basically, we're going to do things with food chains and food webs before we go out. We're going to talk about populations and how they change, maybe like predators and prey, um, and how they interact. Um, basically, so students know or they have an idea of what they're getting into when they go out into the field. The worst thing we could do is take the kids out on a field trip and ask them to do something in the field when we have very limited time and they don't know anything about what we're doing. So we have to give them a little bit of a heads up and give them a little bit of background information, but we don't want to throw them in cold turkey and, and not use the time wisely. All right, so you guys are going to take the coyotes, large squares, and the mice and drop them and see which coyotes each eat how many mice, see if they survive, and then keep doing this generation after generation and see how those populations interact with each other. We're, we're going to go to Lehigh Gap Nature Center next week, um, which is a nonprofit organization that actually purchased uh, one side, the north side of Blue Mountain uh, near Palmerton. Um, and over the past decade, they've been responsible for revegetating that side of the mountain. Um, the, the pollution that occurred from a zinc smelting plant in Palmerton over the course of about 100 years wiped all the vegetation out, mainly because of acid rain from burning coal. Um, several attempts had been made uh, to revegetate it by a number of different agencies and no one was successful. So this organization came in. Actually, one of uh, Freedom's former teachers, Dan Kunkel, is the executive director of Lehigh Gap. Um, and he came in and worked with a bunch of people, EPA, other organizations, and they were able to come up with a method to replant that side of the mountain. So now we, uh, as a group, are going to go and look at some of the progress that's been made um, and I have data from previous years, so the students are going to look at what's growing in specific areas, count some of the different types of plants that are there, and then we're going to relate that to the things we talked about in class and how ecosystems change over time. What we're doing here is the Freedom students are here monitoring succession in our restoration area. We've been monitoring this plot, the same plot, for probably 10 years now. And now as the data is collected, they should notice, comparing it to the old data, that there's been a lot of change here in these, in these plots. Succession is occurring, the vegetation is changing and getting more mature over time. When we do a stream study, what we'll do is we'll go down to the Monocacy Creek and the students will measure different parameters uh, about the creek to determine its health. So for example, they'll look at what's growing on the sides of the creek as far as vegetation. Does that have any kind of influence? They'll measure um, the chemical quality 
uh, of the water, whether it be pH or things like alkalinity, uh, hardness, how cloudy the water is. Uh, so we'll do a bunch of different tests in class as practice, and then we'll take them out into the field and actually do them at the creek. Um, they'll measure some physical parameters, the width, how fast is the water flowing, do they notice anything about the shape of the creek, what's on the bottom of the creek, the depth of the creek. And then last but not least, they actually get into the creek and they take samples of some of the organisms in the creek and we can actually use a scale uh, of different levels of if we find this macroinvertebrate, like a mayfly for example, that tells us about the pollution level. So they'll get all these little microorganisms out of the water, we'll sample them, we'll count them, and we'll put them back. But then with that data, we can actually come up with a quality rating for the stream based on all these parameters that we've collected. A lot of students, because they don't have an environmental science class before this, um, they're not really sure what it's about. They, they get an idea, they think maybe it's about, you know, we're gonna talk about trees or food chains or food webs or something like that. But when we really get into it and, and really get into some of the topics, we, we go from topics like human population. We talk about economics and, and politics a little bit. Um, we talk about energy usage and fossil fuels, pollution. We really run a whole variety of different topics and activities. And some students have never visited the locations we go to. Some students never even knew they existed. Um, and I have students that at the beginning of the course aren't really sure what to make of it. And at the end, they say, oh, I really enjoy this. I never knew environmental science covered all these different things. Just another example of our students making a difference. Up next, we have Thomas Jefferson Elementary School, a gem in our district. Take a look. No, we love Thomas Jefferson because like, they have an awesome leader in me program. Um, that and a lot of the students, they take uh, control out of a lot of the assemblies. The school teaches them how to be leaders for the future. This is an open school concept and I find it to be very great because it gives the children the ability to be able to learn um, and focus on what the educators are teaching them versus being in a closed classroom. What we love about Thomas Jefferson is that it's a community school and all of the staff know all of the kids' names throughout all the grades. The fifth grade teachers know the first grade student's name and vice versa. It's just a warm, loving community school that offers a great education. They are more focused, they're more aware, they're compassionate, they're caring kids. Um, the first thing anyone sees when they come in our school is there's no walls and a lot of people ask, well, how do you teach in that? It's actually better than you would think, and it's a good thing, not a bad thing for the kids. The kids are more focused because of it. Um, it creates a sense of family in our school. As a teacher in third grade, I get to know every kid. I know the kindergartners coming through. I see my third graders go up to fourth and fifth grade, and I still interact with them daily. We have all of our parents and older brothers and sisters come to pick them up after school at the door. You have a sense of belonging here. Um, kids get to see the bigger picture. And because of that, I think they're more caring kids. I need to see your hand. Where did you end? Well, I've had the luxury of working at Thomas Jefferson for over 25 years now, and I'm fortunate in the fact that um, my position as a learning support teacher affords me the opportunity to get to know all the students and, and the families at Thomas Jefferson. Some of our parents are former TJ students, and I'm sure that they would vouch for the fact that they still feel that nice, warm, friendly, small community type vibe when they come through our doors. And I speak for the staff when I say that we wear our BASD badges with pride and especially feel blessed to be a part of the TJ family. Thomas Jefferson Elementary School truly is a special place. You're not going to find a place with more caring adults who are here to service your children and make them the best they can be every day. Come join our Thomas Jefferson family. Thomas Jefferson is another great school in our district. With winter weather coming up, we're wondering what goes into making the decision of a snow day. We're hoping this video clears that up for you. 
Hey everyone, thanks for being here today. You know, people don't understand what goes into making a snow day decision. Um, and it's really kind of simple. We worry about transportation, we worry about walkers, and this group has agreed to take this simple message back to their schools, back to the parents and students, so people can understand a snow day, uh, why we make that snow day decision. Right, Matt? Well, it is that simple. I mean, what we look at is the North Atlantic Oscillation. And, you know, if we've got strong positive phases in that, that usually means, you know, east coast temperatures are going to be much warmer than normal, and the snow is not going to be that impressive. You get the negative NAO, and then you're talking about real cold air and the potential for a real snowy winter, right? Yeah, yeah it is simple. Yeah. It's simple. Wait, how do we know if we have a snow day? Don't be left confused this winter. The Bethlehem Area School District communicates winter closings and delays in the most timely and considerate manner possible. For up-to-date information, consider one of the following. Checking BASD websites and official social media for potential closings and delays. If there is a closing or delay or even an early dismissal due to forecasted weather, there will also be a parent link message sent to parents and guardians across the district. Finally, we also announce our weather-related closings and delays on reputable news outlets like our friends at WFMZ. Stay informed this winter season and don't be left out in the cold. I think you have to go over your part again. Who says we don't have a humor here in Bethlehem? Now let's take a look at some student creative work from our district. The thing that truly impressed and, and left a mark on me was not just the event, but what you saw after that event. Because you saw people from every walk of life, from every corner of the country, trying, fighting to get into New York to help. Instead of running away from the tragedy, they were running into it. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Liberty High School, for having me here today. Um, you know what? Today is a beautiful day. Today is gorgeous. A few clouds in the sky, the sun is shining. It, it reminds me of 16 years ago. The weather was just the same. I was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania that, uh, that day, raising my right hand to swear in to join the United States Marine Corps. And my plan was to leave from Harris Island for basic training on September 11th of 2001. I was then sent back home due to all the flights being grounded around the country due to the attack on our country. From the two planes hitting the Twin Towers in New York City to the plane hitting the Pentagon and then the plane going down in Western Pennsylvania. After we witnessed what happened, I was picked up by my recruiter and sent back home. Uh, while back home, my dad handed me a check, a blank check, to register for classes at Northampton Community College. I politely declined my dad's offer as I made the commitment already to serve my country as it needed me more now than ever. More now than ever. I then reported to Paris Island on September 17th of 2001. After three months of basic training, I was uh, stationed at Camp Lejeune. North Carolina, and finally deployed to Afghanistan on uh, late February 2004 with the 22nd Marine Expeditionary Unit. On April 24th of 2004, my convoy was ambushed by Taliban fighters where uh, two roadside bombs were detonated under my vehicle. Uh, the result was I lost my leg below the knee. Though it was a long recovery, I always remembered why I was there, for all those innocent lives lost on our soil 16 years ago. Today, I challenge everyone here to do three things starting today. Uh, reminisce about today. Well, number two is tell someone you love them. Uh, tell your mom, tell your dad, tell your brother, your sister, your grandparents, or a friend. Send a text, pick up the phone and call, 
send an email. All those innocent lives lost on 9-11 maybe didn't have that chance to tell someone, so take that chance today. Three is thank a service member. Uh, thank a police officer, a firefighter, a first responder, or a veteran on active duty or, or retired. Uh, just a simple thank you goes a long way for their service. How did you start out as a writer? It started out in college. My name is Valerie Rodriguez, and I'm interviewing a man named Edwin Torres Bermudez, a 21-year-old college student who came here from Puerto Rico. He currently takes class courses at El Tri-C in computer forensics, yet fathoms about being an author. As far as being a writer, he is finally his own published author who has created an anthology, Experiences Through Fiction. What's it about? It is an anthology, which is a collection of short stories. Now, the genre is romance, but um, some of the stories will not have happy endings, such as Elizabeth's Smile, which is actually a tragedy. Um, it is a love triangle where one friend betrays the other, even though one friend is actually helping him. Um, it's just events of romance, which happen every day. What kind of audience would you recommend this book to? I'd say young adults, uh, teenagers, people who are trying to find themselves and enjoy classical romance and twists at the end. Although writing may seem like a great profession, there are a lot of difficulties within it. You must be patient, skilled, and widely ranged within the mindset. Creativity may be one of the biggest assets to becoming a writer because without it, then what is there really to write about? What inspired you to begin writing? My girlfriend. And a lot of the events that are in my book are actually about our relationship. Um, my first English class, I started writing short stories. And the first one I wrote was called My Lovely Wings, which is also in the book. Um, I shared it with my peers and they liked it a lot. And from there, I started writing short stories in my spare time, which evolved into the book that is right now. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today. Tune in next month for another episode of The District Insider. I'm Shannon Callahan from Freedom High School. Thanks for watching.